certainly nonpartisan civil servants uh, must be hired and they must be retained because of their ability to actually do the job effectively uh, based on objective performance standards uh, and those standards stay in place uh, regardless of who is uh, serving as the, the president. So my question for you, Ms. Duke, is com compared to appointees who serve at the pleasure of the president, what, what role do civil servants play in helping a presidential administration secure the border, respond to natural disasters, uh, as well as defend against uh, threats uh, from abroad? I would say there's two principal roles uh, in regard to the topic of this hearing. One is to inform policy. So um, with, with years of experience, um, I think that it's important to, for civil servants to understand the policy objective and help inform it so it can be tailored to be most effective. The second role that civil servants have is executing the policy. And I think that's tied to the first because we learn a lot through execution of policy. So what works and what doesn't work. So if we have a, po a policy on constructing a, a physical barrier, like you said, Senator, how can that be done effectively? And what things do we have to consider in doing that? So I think it's an informing and an executing role. Were, were there uh, national security issues or, or, or natural disasters during your time uh, in the uh, federal government where you uh, especially relied on uh, career civil servants uh, to help and uh, develop a response? Could you give us an example that may come to mind? Yes, um, consistently, both as a senior executive service career, relying on junior people, but then also as a, a, a two-time political appointee. Um, you know, one example was uh, I was uh, at, at the start of President Obama's uh, administration. We had H1N1, which was the, the, the first COVID, if you will, never came to the extent. And really talking to the civil servants about what can we do to prevent the spread in, in Homeland Security, the use of personal protective equipment, how do we deal with um, antibiotics, but, but really having to understand the workforce and how we could stop the spread of this. Another example more recently, um, when I was back in government, is making decisions on temporary protective status. What, uh, not only what's the letter of the law in terms of deciding whether to extend temporary protective status, but what implications could that have across other areas of government um, so that we make the right decision, but also de deploy that decision, if you will, in the most effective way. Very good. Uh, Mr. Uh, Levine, uh, what, what types of risk uh, uh, from uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, defense of uh, perspective would be heightened if the department lost access to the expertise uh, that, that is unique uh, with uh, career civil servants? Well, there's really nothing that the department does that it does without, other than actual operations on the battlefield, nothing that it does without uh, the direct involvement of civilian employees. And even on the battlefield, you have employees in a supporting role. So the logistic systems of the department, the communication systems of the department, um, the acquisition systems of the department, the personnel systems of the department, all run with a substantial input on, by the expertise of the civilians. If you didn't have that expertise, you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to get, uh, get, our, sold, get our, 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 our service members paid, you'd be hard pressed to get their families taken care of, and you'd be hard pressed to, to, to equip and, and, and train our, our soldiers so they could operate in the field. So there is no aspect of the department's operations that does not have civilians DOD civilians embedded in it. And that relies on deep expertise. And uh, you could put in other people to do it, but without the expertise that you have there now, I, I worry that, that, that the functioning would, would not be as good. It would start with the budget process. The budget process, putting together a budget in the Department of Defense, an, an $800, $900 billion budget, is an incredibly complex process. And we think, we tend to think at a political level of a few major issues that overarch, that, that have, have heavy political weight, but there is a lot of detail going down to every, uh, going down to the $100,000, $10,000 level and putting together the pieces and making, they, making sure they fit together. And again, civilians play absolutely critical role in that process and without their expertise, I don't know, I don't know that you'd be able to fund the department. 
Well, I just follow up on that. Uh, you know, it's important to put in perspective the Department of Defense uh, is the largest uh, federal agency in the U.S. government, and it employs uh, this is the number seven hundred thousand civilian uh, employees, uh, a massive organization. So, my question for you, and you, and you raised this uh, in, in your uh, opening comments, um, in your experience in leadership roles at the Department of Defense, including as the principal advisor on personnel policy and management. Did you personally experience or observe career civil servants acting in a partisan way to block the president's political goals? I never, I never saw that happen, no sir. Ms. Duke, uh, the Department of Homeland Security is the third largest uh, cabinet department uh, in the U.S. government. And my question for you is, in your experience as Deputy Secretary and Acting Secretary during a Republican administration, to what extent did you observe insubordination uh, by uh, civilian uh, public servants? I did not observe that by our civil servants. Mr. De uh, Mr. Uh, De Devine, uh, whistleblowers uh, play uh, an integral role in providing uh, oversight for the, the federal government, ensuring uh, that fraud, uh, waste, and abuse uh, is identified. And certainly, I think all of us on this committee understand the importance of whistleblowers and continually work to protect uh, their status. My question is to you is, to what extent do you think uh, converting civil servants to appointees serving at the will of a president's political leadership would actually impact the willingness of whistleblowers to come forward? I know you talked about this in your opening comments, but I think it's important to really drill down as to what that impact will be. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think some examples might be helpful to illustrate their impact. Um, they, uh, Whistleblowers at the Department of Defense stopped the routine purchase of the world's most expensive um, nuts, bolts, toilets, toilet seats, coffee pots, and other um, items that were purchased. Um, they stopped blanket domestic surveillance, working through the Department of Defense Office of Inspector General in sparking passage the USA Freedom Act. They forced delivery of mine-resistant vehicles that uh, have been held up due to political obstruction um, and reduced the number of um, fatalities, uh, which were 90% in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and 60% casualties from, mine, from landmines to 5% casualties from landmines. They prevented the federal air marshals, for example, from going AWOL during a confirmed, more ambitious Al-Qaeda rerun of 9-11 back in 2003. They prevented the trillion-dollar next phase of Star Wars after the Army's chief scientist, a career employee, exposed that um, that billion dollar investment would have been irrelevant for the nation's defense. Um, over and over again, they've changed the course of history. Um, and they couldn't have done this without the Merit System's freedom of speech. Well, currently, there are uh, nearly 4,000 uh, political appointee positions uh, throughout the, the federal government. Uh, most presidents, uh, let's be very clear, most presidents have a very difficult time filling a majority of those positions. They, they are left unfilled. And, and so my question, and I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Duke and uh, Mr. Levine and Ms. Uh, uh, Manningly to, to respond to this. So adding uh, at least 50,000 more political positions as proposed by the advocates of Schedule F uh, I believe would undoubtedly result in a higher number of, of vacant positions uh, at these agencies. So if each of you could address, uh, we'll start with Ms. Duke and work down, you know, what, what, what would the impact be of all these un massive unfilled positions? What's this gonna mean for the, uh, for the American people and the work that needs to be, to, to get done? Uh, so put it in terms that folks will understand what this could, could mean. Ms. Duke. I, th I think the impact is in the Department of Homeland Security specifically, what needs to get done will get done at the minimum levels. But what you don't do is you, you don't drive forward excellence and you don't drive forward the growth of um, having a strong Homeland Security Department. So in DHS, we've had Senate confirmed. There's only, I believe, 18 or 19 Senate confirmed. Those, uh, several of them have been vacant. Um, so I think it's important that you, we will ensure, the civil servants are so dedicated, they'll ensure that life and safety is taken care of. But what won't happen is excellence, and our country deserves excellence. Um, and the vacancies definitely uh, contribute to our ability to, to drive forward to excellence in Homeland Security. Mr. Levine. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would guess there, there are roughly 30,000 or so people working in the Pentagon every day. I would, so I would guess that, that perhaps 10,000 or so would be covered by, by the Schedule F proposal. It's, it's just a guess. I don't think the Department did, did the work to, 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 or did the analysis to figure out exactly which positions would be covered. I'd like to put that in the context of what happens in a presidential transition, because if the president who first imposed Schedule F would probably figure, I can replace people over time, it's not going to be a great, there's not going to be any great discontinuity. The problem is if one president replaces 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000, then the next president's going to come in and feel that he or she can't rely on those 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 people. So you're going to have it. Right now, what happens in a presidential transition is all the political appointees leave, and it takes a long time to bring in new people. It takes six months to a year to bring in the, the, the critical core of people that you need at the political level to, to, to run the Department of Defense. During that period of transition, the, the, the handful of career, uh, the handful of political people who come into the department rely on those career civilians who have the experience who can keep the lights on and keep things running during the period before they can get more politicals in. So if instead of having to re replace a few hundred political employees to, and, and being able to rely on the career employees, you had to replace 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, you wouldn't be able to keep the lights on during that transition. You wouldn't be able to run the building if you fired the people who, were political, who you felt were political hacks who were brought in by the, by the previous administration, and you wouldn't know who you could turn to, who you could rely on. That would probably also have an impact on the civilian the civil military relations in the department and the balance between civilians and military in the department because the department is unique, of course, in having a, a, a huge military workforce with, with senior military. And what happens when you have an absence of, of civilian leadership is the military just by default takes on bigger roles. So you would, in, in, in some ways, you would risk really undermining civilian control over the military, at least during this transition period, while you didn't have civilians you could rely on to run the department. Thank you. And Ms. Mattingly, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts uh, government-wide, what, what, what this would mean? Yes, one of the things we've seen, and we have at the partnership a Center for Presidential Transition, so we work a lot on uh, a nonpartisan basis with candidates, campaigns, and administrations across um, both parties. But what we hear overall is that it is difficult to bring these folks in. You mentioned 4,000, that's both presidentially appointed ones and then over 1,300 that require confirmation of the Senate. I've heard one former political appointee say it feels a little bit like it's in neutral gear agencies are because they do not have those top level leaders in place to kind of direct the policy of the incoming administration. You also have people sitting in acting positions and oftentimes when they're acting, they're wearing two or three hats. So they're doing three people's jobs under one person. And so that just makes it hard to make the longer term decisions, makes it hard to think about reform, makes it hard to prioritize each of those individual jobs. We also see that relationships with Congress, especially as Congress is doing its oversight role when there aren't political appointees in place with the authority to speak on behalf of the administration, that also sometimes makes it a challenge. And so these vacancies can be hard as well on employee morale. People look to their leaders to direct the agencies. And so not having leadership in place can certainly be a drain on morale which just impacts agency operations. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I agree, career employees are running the day-to-day -day implementation of work, but that leadership is important to the direction of an agency. And certainly the continuity of, uh, of operations during a presidential transition would be a, would be a mess, as uh, Mr. Levine said. Mr. Devine, you have a comment? Yes, sir. Um, I think the, the bottom line is that you'd have, for those employees, uh, a labor force uh, of people whose primary duty is loyalty to the president rather than public service. Uh, and, sir, I'm not convinced that this would be um, limited to 50,000 employees. Um, that's the current roster of jobs that need to be approved by the White House. That roster can be expanded. Uh, and further, the text of the executive order um, that's that created Schedule F is so open-ended that the limited boundaries are not reliable. Um, the positions of confidential policy determining, policy making, or policy advocating character, well, that includes employees who work on agency regulations, who have discretion in exercising legal functions, who engage in activities covered by the deliberative process, or work for, for or with anyone who is just 13 or higher. Who else is left? <laughs> 